Hello and welcome to the Property Roundup here on iProperty Radio with myself, Carol Tallon, the show where we chat to industry experts to get a view of activity on the ground and to learn about new trends emerging. This show is brought to you in sponsorship with uh, DAF.ie, Ireland's most visited property website. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Mary Liz Mahoney of Council within Maples Group, Ireland. Mary Liz, you're very welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Hi, Carol. Thank you so much for having me. Delighted to be here. Uh, I'm so delighted. It's the first time we've had an opportunity to speak to to Maples Group. And I know that uh, you and the team, they're working across construction and real estate. You're at a really pivotal uh, time uh, advising clients, you know, particularly uh, as, as we look at maybe some of the changes that are happening in construction and real estate. And we're balancing them with not just changing market conditions, but really having come through a period over the last number of years of such upheaval when we were only getting back to a sense of balance after the crash. So it's been a really interesting few years um, of of maybe construction and real estate firms being in survival mode. And now they're straight away having to adjust to essentially a new way of delivering and managing real estate. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's exciting times, challenging, definitely. Um, and I think obviously the main thing that that is on the kind of the buzzword of, of ESG has been, you know, taking along the background as as other things have 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 been, you know, more pressing. But right now, the, the legal and regulatory landscape is changing so quickly that this is really the topic that now everybody has to focus on. And, you know, it's just really from right across the um, right across the sector, whether you're in um, development projects or you're managing existing stock. And um, it's just it's just hugely important. Um, and I think, you know, I'm obviously with Maples Group, we're a professional services firm. And um, we provide legal advice, but also other services such as funds and regulatory and compliance services. And um, we're in 16 locations across the globe. And obviously we're in Ireland. And because a key focus for us is financial services and investment management, it means we have a lot of institutional and investment clients who are very active in the Irish real estate market. So, you know, we look after them from fund formation to project delivery. So we're absolutely, you know, at the coal face of the change because because we're bringing them bringing them through that. They're international clients. They want to know what's going on. So so that's kind of hugely important for me and my colleagues in, in the real estate and construction group in Maples uh, to be on top of the changes. Very good. And, you know, over the last number of years, we've been looking at um, prop tech and construction tech and climate tech solutions uh, for across the built environment, really for almost uh, eight, nine years now. And there was always a question of what are the drivers? You know, are are the drivers um, doing good? Are the are the drivers really about sustainability? Um, and and what's really changed is that that's not a conversation anymore. We used to have to make the business case. You know, doing well, doing good while doing well, and um, th- that's changed. Now we don't need to ask the question anymore. The regulatory drivers are really uh, very clearly defined. But because because so much was happening in the background before regulation that actually in a way uh in a way best practice was ahead of policy but now policy has very much caught up and that's actually confusing some of the early leaders in the industry so you might just take us through uh maybe what are some of the regulatory uh some of some of the um I suppose the regulatory position uh, from an Irish and European perspective and really what's coming down the tracks for real estate um and for construction yeah, so I think really when you look at at all the drivers, and um, they are, and even just the legal and regulatory environment, it's it's kind of very important. And you know this, right? From 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 a real estate perspective, you know it's never just someone coming in and developing something. They are answering uh, not only to the answering as themselves uh, to their own legal legal requirements, but they're also looking upstream to their funders, those providing advice, what sort of obligations do they have and what sort of, you know, what sort of needs do, does a funder want from a project? So you've got to satisfy them if you want your project funded. You also then are looking, and, and, and I'm just speaking as a developer, but obviously people involved are all different types of stakeholders, but then you're also looking downstream at your contractors. You know, what, you know, what's driving them 
Um, and, and also, how can they help you deliver? And they have to help you deliver because they're, they're, they're your partners in this process. Um, and then you're also thinking about your end users, whether they're your tenants or they're somebody that will ultimately purchase the building. You know, what sort of buildings can they let? You know, what, what's driving them? What's blocking them from investing in a building that's that's not up to, to, to the, you know, the top, the top sustainable standard as of today? Um, and then, you know, so all of that is really important. So you can't really just look at, you know, what's what's affecting us. You have to think, well, you know, how, how are we going to pay for this building? How are we going to build it? And when we built it, then, you know, who's going to who's going to occupy it? Who's going to buy it? And what do they want? So so that's a huge piece. That's always I mean, these stakeholders are not new, but what the, these stakeholders need in a sustainability um you know, environment is, is quite different. And now, as you say, it's regulated. It's not a nice to have. We're actually moving into, well, actually, we have to comply with this. And I think what's also very important is when you had a nice to have kind of situation, you're saying, oh, look, we've got this, you know, lead gold or lead platinum certification on our building. And, and that's wonderful. But now with the kind of level of reporting, corporate, uh, the CSRD, um, all, all that kind of level of reporting that happens upstream, also in terms of access to financing, it's not just what your building is rated day one. There's going to be ongoing, you know, information that's required, ongoing data that's going to have to be gathered. So the life cycle of the building is going to become hugely important you know, when you when you check in on the building in five years time, like, you know, are the are the solar panels delivering what they what they were supposed to deliver? Because now it actually really matters. It really matters. Um. So and 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 we can talk about this a little bit later. But that you know, this new energy performance of buildings directive, like the building is going to have to meet the standards, and it's not. And that's not day one. That's year five. That's year ten. Um, and 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 that data point is, you know, um, that data point is going to have to go out to your tenants, your purchasers is going to have to go out to your funders, but it's also have to, to go out to your, you know, for yourself, you know, if you're a developer. Um, and I think that this whole life cycle thing is so interesting for me because you will know like business information modeling and all that, that's been around for such a long time and having, you know, and it's it's sort of I suppose it kind of come on a lot in recent years, but a lot of people have been banging the drum about, you know, we need to look at you know how we can if we look at the life cycle of a building, how we can actually uh, you know deliver ultimately over its life cycle, it's going to be a cheaper building, right? Because we're looking at at, at what we do, and it's been very hard to kind of get people on board with that. But now they absolutely have to be, and yeah. I, and I think that's key. It's it's an interesting dynamic just because you've touched on it there, uh, the EU directive on the performance of buildings. You might just actually take us through maybe some of the detail of that and um, the timeline involved. Yeah, so the the um, and and to be honest, there's actually like and this is kind of part of the pain. And we'll get on to the positivity a bit later, but but there's actually a ton of stuff like the, because real estate and construction is so fast. You've got your renewable energy directive. You've got your energy efficiency directive. They've both, you know, come on stream in October, November last year. So so the energy performance building is, is I suppose it's a big part of the piece. Uh, it's what everyone's focusing on, but I will just say it's not the only thing. Uh, but but the energy performance building directive is essentially um about to be adopted. It was provisionally agreed in December 2023. Um, so we're kind of expecting it kind of quarter one. I mean, it's the 15th of February. Maybe maybe it's still a month or two away. What it'll do is it, it, it focuses on new buildings um, and it also focuses then on existing stock. So the it's anticipated that what we're going to have is by 2026, all publicly owned and operated buildings are going to have to have this ZEB standard, so not NZEB anymore, ZEB, which is basically a zero emission building. Um, the building's going to have to have very high energy performance and the, the low amount of energy that's required is either going to have to come from renewable sources on site or else say, you know, district 
you know, say a, a district heating model, something in the district or at community level. Um, so that's 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 2026 um, for public buildings. Uh, we're looking at 2028 then for all other new buildings. And then ultimately having the all existing stock like across the EU to have this zero emission rating basically by 2050, which and merely, in the past is actually not that far away. How prepared are your clients for this? Um, I think that they are they are certainly ramping up. All eyes are on this. So I think our message to our clients is the time is now. It's not too late, but it is now. Looking at your and I and I think a lot of people have been kind of doing this or they're aware of it. Um, you know, new buildings, you know, that that's almost they kind of look after themselves in many ways because you're sitting down, you're planning a new project. And sustainability is just part of the project planning. For existing stock, you absolutely have to be sitting down and looking at your portfolio and figuring out, you know, what what are the underperforming buildings? What are the kind of buildings that would be suitable uh, for renovation? Um, and, and, you know, where you are on your, your existing portfolio. There will be, I mean, the whole idea of the directive is there's going to be points in time where you can bring buildings up to compliance. There'll be essentially a, um, it's called an energy performance certificate. But the idea is that it'll be essentially a passport for the building. So you can renovate in stages um, and you could be kind of bringing your building up through the ratings um, over time. Now, there's not a huge amount of detail on that. So I think like, and, and you can, you I'm sure you'll agree with me on this. You know, there absolutely has to be government guidance, government supports. We're doing this together. Um, and I was talking to somebody, you know, earlier about this. And it, 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 this is definitely all of this piece, particularly on the existing stock piece. It's It's collaboration across all of the stakeholders. Um, you know, and there's a huge technical piece as well from yeah. the contracting side, the, the special subcontractors, the architects, the engineers. You know, what's the technical solution to get here? How do we do uh, creative and innovative retrofits? Um, yeah. but, but, but the government um, should be leading the way. And, and, and I think, to be fair, they, they are saying in the climate action plans that are being released annually, they're leading the way. Um, the public they obviously have a duty in relation to public buildings but but it's, it's a whole collaboration piece because given the time frames you sort of have one chance to get it right yeah um you know, I, i'm really glad that you touched on the collaboration piece but i do i uh, i agree with you that it needs to go beyond that actually i think collaboration is great but when you're looking at regulatory drivers then actually this absolutely needs to be state led from the technical side of it because quite frankly there isn't the opportunity or the margin at this time within the industry to test new technologies yeah. to see what works actually that's exactly what the government ought to be resourcing and to be fair i do think that that has started through a number of di different academic groups like um you know most of the universities would have uh, an undertaking um, in this space at the moment and particularly Construct Innovate. We see a lot through MMC Ireland. So there's huge happening, um, but the government has to, the government is resourcing it. Actually, I think that's the first thing to say. There's definitely money and resources being made available. Whether they're going in the right direction is a different conversation, but we absolutely need to take the trial and error out of this um, when we're dealing with such a short time period and the challenges of our existing stock being so large. And I suppose that that leads me to to question, you know, the sentiment across the industry, because we're already coming off the back of and, and are still in the midst of some really challenging market conditions. We're already uh, suffering the, the ill effects of our planning regime and the new planning and development bill, you know, already hundreds of amendments is it it's not going to be the radical overhaul that we were promised at all um so projects are already suffering from viability whether they're new projects or uh redevelopment and retrofit projects so what's the sentiment out there amongst your clients like do they do they think that this is achievable 
understanding the market conditions that are there and the economic realities of such projects? Yeah, well, I think absolutely. I think clients feel like not to, to just to go back to the collaboration piece. I absolutely believe that in terms of margins and ability to actually test new technologies, you know, absolutely the, 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 that kind of public role is really important. I do think, though, the experience and knowledge of the private sector in actually getting things done, that needs to feed in. You know, because, yeah, things are tough, but you know what? I, If you look at how the construction industry, for example, responded to COVID, like the resilience, um, there, there's absolutely an ability, I think, within the real estate and construction industry to get things done. And I think that's what they can bring to this conversation, 100%. And 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 that that's kind of the spirit you need because it's a really tough. We will be able to. We'll also be able to to lean on other countries and um, within the EU and and even you know the UK are, are are doing things as well. Obviously in this space, so we'll have to look at what's being achievable. Obviously con- con- conscious of our climate, you know, being different to other countries in the EU in terms of what solutions will work here. And and like I I have contacts who are ESG consultants. You know, and they tell me kind of what they're looking at because they're focused on the on on the on the the technical piece, and they are looking at other countries. So so there is resources, um, but I definitely see it as as public and private coming together. Yeah, look, I I, I do completely agree with you, and in fact, um, the private or the public sector funding that we know is being made available. So that vital first step has happened has happened, and on the other side of it. Actually, the the industry does have that on the ground expertise and they are building that technical knowledge. So essentially what we need are systems to ensure that the private industry, uh, particularly those who are resourcing innovation and uh, trying to solve these technical problems, that they are being aided by state. Because to me, it's that that's the disconnect. Um, so we have the government making funds available. We have the industry building knowledge, but that only very large players in the industry can build that. So if they're not sharing it through some mechanism like Construct Innovate, like MFC yeah. Ireland, like some of those bodies, which most of them are. And to be fair, you know, Mary Liz, I think you are much more generous uh, in your description of it, because, you know, sometimes and I really felt like uh, particularly uh, after the crash, but I, I felt it again during covid Sometimes we talk about the resilience of the construction industry in a way that almost expects them I to know. bounce back. We keep hitting them. And in fact, um, actually, academic studies have shown that some of the resilience that is required in the construction industry is the resilience to be able to overcome bad policy. And actually, I want to get us a step up ahead of that. So actually... The, I don't think the construction industry should need to be resilient against bad policy. They need to be resilient against market forces about some of the geopolitical uh, things that are going on around the world at the moment, uh, supply chain disruption, interest yeah. rates. But they shouldn't need to be resilient about bad policy. We want government to get better at policy. And that's something that I feel is happening. Um, but there's still some disconnections there. But look, to be fair, there's definitely enough happening for us to be hopeful. But the government really does need to step up now as opposed to leaning on the industry and saying the industry needs to step up. They've done their bit by by making money available, but now they have to be very careful that that money is funneled through to where the innovation is happening, where the technical exploration is happening. And that's the really vital part. And actually, to be fair, Maples Group, I know, are already recognising and rewarding this uh, because I know that you're a sponsor of the Sustainability Initiative Award within the National Property Awards coming up on the 29th of February um, at the Intercontinental. So it's that's a great initiative to be doing. Tell me what what um, made you look towards kind of uh, sponsoring the Sustainability Initiative? Is that is that something that you feel needs to be recognised or rewarded across the industry? Yeah, no, look, absolutely. And I think, look, the really important thing about Maples Group is that ESG and sustainable investing is actually part of our DNA. You know, Maples were involved in some of the very first sustainable investment funds and green bonds. And we're just continuing, you know, we're continuing when it was a niche market, we were there. So we're just continuing now to support our clients. And as you said at the outset, 
it's gone from, you know, a good thing to do to, to something that kind of has to be done. So so we're still here and, and we're hugely focused on this. And we we have to be because that's where our clients are. And um, but 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 we we're this is we're building on kind of knowledge that that we've been working with for for quite a while in this space, and we're absolutely delighted to be sponsored. It's a fantastic award. I think the National Property Awards are you know they're it's going to be a fantastic day out. I'm I'm just really excited to kind of meet and greet everybody in the industry and look at some of the awards that some of the people have been nominated and some of the fantastic projects. And, and I think it's just, you know, you've got to have that showcase to acknowledge, you know, people who are leading this as well. It's really important. Yeah, look, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And in fact, um, this year had the largest number of entries, which is great. Um, it's great to see. And in fact, actually, I, 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 I interviewed um, some of the judging panel previously, and I'm delighted to be involved in it myself. And in fact, Actually, one of the points that came out was that even the process of entering, so even those companies that didn't make it through to the shortlist or that might not, that won't go on to be the eventual winners, there's a process in sitting down to prepare an award like this that that requires a level of reflection of what you're doing, uh, reflection on maybe what's happening, and uh, you know, understanding and maybe assessing what's best practice across the industry and allowing yourself. To be led by that. So, um, yes, you know, we've talked about the different drivers in place, but industry best practice is still something that best in class aspire to. And when they do this, it's great to have an opportunity to showcase, because I think sometimes construction and real estate in Ireland takes such a an unfair hammering. And I, for me, it's really important that we have uh, almost a platform to showcase what's good because actually that's bringing there, there's an ever widening gap between the best in class and those who are being somewhat left behind uh, with um, increasing regulation and uh, the increase in technology that's driving digitalization across real estate and construction that I do worry about the gap and those being left behind. And I think the award is one of those places to showcase and hopefully almost offer a bridge to say, listen, this is how you can follow the example. This is best practice. Start the journey and and the resources are there to, to bring you along. So I think that's a really important one. Um, and actually speaking of resources, maybe finally for today, um, you might just because this is quite a complex area for many. And, you know, sometimes there's a lot of information but you have to be careful about the credibility of the information and really pointing people in the direction of understanding what data to collect. What are the important metrics? What are the really credible and robust standards that we have to work on towards that actually will bring you in line with compliance? So is there any resource that you can point uh, people to there? Yeah, so basically we've invested a huge amount of time putting together a dedicated part of our website, the Maples website. We have a... We have a, a booklet. This this is a it's available on our website, um, ESG and sustainable investing. It covers everything um, right across from you know investment funds to to finance to corporate, um, and also obviously real estate and construction. Um, and and we talk about all you know the different things that we advise our clients on, and 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 you know what's what's kind of happening at the moment in terms of different ideas that you can do to get on top of you know in your leases or your construction contracts and you know i i could talk i mean i think you could talk all day about this um so i'm excited about it for that reason you know the the resources are you know they're on our website have a look um and also i think as well it's just to get back to what you're saying about the National Property Awards and the Sustainability Award. It's, you know, getting the word out there, getting people focused, um, because ultimately, the more we kind of talk about this, the more we'll, we'll, we'll kind of get the learnings. As I said, it's it's a collaboration piece and we can't afford to get it wrong. Yeah, look, I think that's a really compelling message on which to close. You know, we really, we can't afford to get this wrong. Um. Um, at a, at an individual and institutional level, but also at a national and EU level as well. So thank you so much for taking the time um, and sharing your expertise and insights there from your clients. It's always interesting to hear what the sentiment is from the ground up. And uh, I look forward to meeting you and the team at the Intercontinental at the National Property Awards on the 29th of February. Uh, that was Mary Liz 
Uh, mm-hmm. Mahoney of Council within Maples Group Ireland. My thanks to Katie Talon and to the production team at Hear Me Roar Media and also thanks to our show sponsor Daft.ie, Ireland's most visitor property website. And thank you indeed for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Property Roundup. In the meantime, please be sure to check out all of the other Irish and international real estate and construction shows here on iPropertyRadio.com. 